Hello, my name is Jeff Hardman from the Wallace Center at Windrock International. Welcome to the National Good Food Network webinar, Raising Dough for Food Businesses. There are so many bright, innovative, good food entrepreneurs, many in need of capital to grow and meet the enormous demand for good food. There is, in fact, a lot of capital out there, but a huge challenge is knowing where to look for it, how to access it, and very importantly, which type of capital is appropriate for each individual business. This webinar aims to begin to get you thinking about each of these points and how to advise your constituents or yourself. This webinar was supported in part by the beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Um, so now let me introduce you to uh, the Wallace Center and its National Good Food Network. The Wallace Center is a business unit of Winrock International and is the host of the NGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that is healthier for the people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we're focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It is structured as a network of networks ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from the boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there's an abundant supply good food to meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can lo learn more about the great work of the National Good Food Network on our website, ngfn.org. We have a library of fantastic resources for scaling up good food. Especially of our note is our section on food hubs. You can get there directly by typing foodhub.info into your browser. And we also archive all of our webinars there, as I've mentioned. Please feel free to contact us. Email address is contact at ngfn.org. So with that, uh, let me uh, introduce our first esteemed panelist today. Uh, Elizabeth Yu has spent the last decade working to bring down the barriers that prevent sustainable food entrepreneurs from solving social and environmental problems. Founder and executive director of the nonprofit Finance for Food, Elizabeth regularly delivers workshops on the intersecting topics of community capital, impact investing, food entrepreneurship, and sustainable food systems at conferences geared toward business owners, funders, institutional and individual investors, nonprofits, technical assistance providers, and academic audiences. Previously, she served on the management team at RSF Social Finance, where she helped launch a loan fund for high-impact food businesses. She has also served on the staff at the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, Bali, and Slow Money, which was then a project of Investors Circle. Elizabeth. Okay, so uh, we agreed to fit far too much into this presentation. I think we we're trying to squeeze about two hours into 20 minutes, so this uh, apology in advance. Um, we wanted to cover quite a few interesting things. Um, so if it seems like I'm going too fast, it's because I'm, I am rushing. <laughs> so yes, we posed a provocative question. Is there, in fact, a lack of access to capital? And I think as we were preparing this presentation, we agreed that there is, in fact, more capital than ever before, partially because uh, several many individuals across the country are looking for better ways to invest their own savings and retirement monies into things that are more in alignment with their own values, but also more and more um, commercial, institutional, and funder type investors are realizing that, that food businesses in particular are addressing many social and environmental issues, um, whether that be human health, environmental health, animal welfare, economic development. I mean, the list goes on and on, all the different things that food businesses are helping address. And so we're seeing a lot more interest in food businesses on the part of investors. And yet, it still seems like um, for entrepreneurs who are trying to raise capital, that we're trying to put together a, a puzzle where not all the puzzle pieces exist yet. So, you know, what what are some of the barriers um, to connecting interested investors with entrepreneurs trying to raise money for their good food ventures? So these barriers exist at every level. On the entrepreneur side, um, we often see that uh, investors are finding that entrepreneurs lack business savvy, or, or often you'll hear investors say that entrepreneurs aren't ready for capital yet. 
where they're having a hard time finding entrepreneurs that are appropriate for their investing parameters. Um, individual investors, often those who are new to investing, don't understand how to, to vet different investment opportunities. They don't understand food businesses. Um, also on the part of commercial lenders and investors, they might understand more industrial or traditional food business models, or you know, a lot of investors understand tech business models, but they don't necessarily understand what these good food businesses look like and how to compare them to the types of investments they want to make. Um, federal agencies are actually seeing some great work um, and some movement here, but a lot of federal agencies that do support or do have programs that um, can help good food ventures, they don't often uh, know that. A lot of the field officers might, might not be aware that, that they can, for instance, support a cold storage facility at a food hub, or that, you know, they might think that their their programs are only el eligible for, say, grain silos or something. And we're talking about food storage, so we have some of those issues on the federal side. Um, professional advisors, which include everyone from um, attorneys and accountants, other paid consultants, um, they only advise about what they know. And so some of these newfangled financing techniques are um, they just don't know about them yet, so they're not likely to advise their clients to use them. And then um, other technical assistance providers, whether we're talking about um, nonprofit farming groups or, or local business networks, or um, it could be anyone from university extension agents, that, that sort of technical assistance provider. Again, um, they're recently showing a lot of interest in financial tools in addition to, say, you know, production techniques for the farming groups. Um, but again, you can only advise on what you know. And so I think one of the things that I have decided is, is really an important leverage point um, is that no matter what your role is in this picture, you can really only assess a financial tool as a good fit for yourself or for your clients um, or for your lenders or for your borrowers if you know that these financial tools exist in the first place. And um, so that's why I wrote the book, Raising Dough, The Complete Guide to Financing a Socially Responsible Food Business, it's because um, increasing the level of awareness of these different tools increases the likelihood that we'll be able to find a good fit for entrepreneurs that are raising money for their food businesses. Um, so in addition to the fact uh, that there's these barriers at every, in every role and at every level, um, there aren't necessarily enough financing tools that exist yet that meet all of the values and priorities of some of these good food businesses. And so that's something that um, we can start to change if we've mapped out what's available in a different area. Um, and then there's the fact that uh, overarching all of these issues, the securities law and the capital markets landscape is somewhat obscure and it's a, it's a moving target. Securities laws are changing, but um, it's a very confusing area of law. Very few attorneys understand it. And so you know, this kind of makes the entire space a bit confusing for the rest of us to sort out. So, if we're talking about aligning investor dollars with the values, what are some of the food entrepreneur values that affect which types of financing tools are a good fit? Um, so some of the most important have to do with the ideal business size and the rate of growth that the entrepreneur expects to grow the business at and that their lifestyle priorities. A lot of people are doing food businesses as a, a side project, but maybe this is someone who's really focusing 125% of their life energy into it. Um, that'll affect the right type of financing to match them with. Um, but there's also questions of ownership. Are, are they really looking to provide ownership or create wealth within their community, or do they mind selling equity and stock in their company to folks that are farther away? That will affect what type of financing to look for. How long have they been in business? How long have they been actually earning revenues? Um, how close are they to becoming profitable or breaking even? That affects which types of financing we'll look at. And then there's the whole question of um, what type of impact are they trying to affect on the ground? Um, maybe they're looking at food access or job creation or, or different health outcomes. What is their commitment to local? All of these, again, um, different ways of, of classifying an entrepreneur's priorities and, and different investors make the most sense for them to pursue given their given those values and priorities. So a few other considerations to keep in mind. How much is an entrepreneur trying to raise? Are they trying to raise a little bit or millions of dollars? Um, how expensive is it to access these different types of financing? Some of them you have to pay quite a bit um, in order to raise the money, so you want to make sure you're raising a minimum amount before those make sense. Um, how soon do they need the money? Um, some of these techniques are very quick. Other, most of them, I would say, take a lot more time. 
how much paperwork is an entrepreneur willing to put up with, especially with some of the federal programs. I've heard a lot of entrepreneurs complaining about the both the application process, but also the amount of paperwork required to do the reporting over time. Um, is this the kind of person that wants to do it themselves? Or are they willing to work with professionals to um, access different types of financing? How easy are the, the different financing tools to manage versus how much care and feeding they require over time? Um, something you don't hear a lot talked about um, is the fact that you know, some people are very extroverted and social creatures. Other folks are more introverted and you know, they'd rather just click a button rather than do some sort of complicated um, community supported financing mechanism. And then there's this issue of uh, lower credit scores or good credit scores. I think particularly when we're talking about working with entrepreneurs in low income communities or new immigrants, um, they might not have great credit scores and they might not have any credit record at all. Um, and I, I should have mentioned also collateral. What type of collateral do folks have? These, these definitely play into the options that are available to different types of entrepreneurs. And so I wanted to paint a picture, too, about how the money flows from interested investors into the businesses that are trying to raise the capital. Um, on the left here, we have some members of the Slow Money Northern California group. These are interested uh, people interested in investing in, in food businesses close to them. And then on the right, we have Brahma Mahdi with the People's Community Market, uh, which we hope will soon be a grocery store in an area of West Oakland that doesn't have access to much fresh uh, healthy food. So people can invest directly in the people's community market or there are intermediary institutions, this would include say banks or credit unions um, that people can park their savings in that might invest in a food business. Um, then there's other institutions such as uh, say federal agencies or foundations that can invest directly into food businesses but the general public can't necessarily um, invest in these, these types of institutions. And then, of course, over time, a business will probably need all of the above at um, one point or another over their life cycle. Um, but it looks a lot more complicated. It will probably look something more like this. And um, the important take-home message here is that every entrepreneur situation is very unique. Every business is unique. And the types of investors that exist in the area where the, uh, the business is, it's, it, what this picture looks like in any case will be very, very different. So what are the actual puzzle pieces, what are the types of uh, financing tools that we can put together to help an entrepreneur? I'm going to go through some of them and not in enough detail, this is probably just enough to make you frustrated that you have to find out more, but again this tip of the iceberg approach is all that we've got time for today and I didn't want to spend too much time on this because I do cover most of these in the book in much more detail. Um, but the one I will spend a little bit more time on is um, lending circles, also known as saving circles, because um, these are not covered in the book. Um, around the world, people are using um, this type of model to lend and borrow money from each other. So small groups, small community groups will come together and, and lend money to, to each other. And they're called different things in different parts of the world. They're called tandas in Mexico, susus. Um, in Africa, they exist all over Asia, so in a lot of low-income and immigrant communities in the United States, people are already doing this kind of lending and saving in these circles, and um, what's exciting to me now is that there are several organizations that are working to formalize the, these lending circles and are reporting successful payments to credit bureaus so that um, these folks are starting to um, build a credit record and become part of the more formal economy, which will help them be eligible for other types of capital in the future. So these are very exciting to me. Um, and uh, sorry, these are roughly organized in an order that an entrepreneur might use them over the course of their business. So from like from a startup all along to a very mature business, this is how these, these next few slides are organized. Um, so individual development accounts are exciting in the um, corporation, well, I forget what CFED stands for exactly, but uh, this is an exciting program, again, usually for low-income people or some other disadvantaged community members. Um, individual development accounts help individuals with savings, so for every dollar that somebody saves, um, it is matched with philanthropic dollars, sometimes up to $8, so for every $1 you save, uh, another $8 goes into your account up to a certain amount, and this can be used for every, anything from applying for citizenship to starting a business, and I think this is a, a great tool that can be used in certain communities. 
Um, friends and family loans, this is a picture of my Thanksgiving dinner. The important thing here to keep in mind, especially as you're advising your clients, is you really want to make sure that people are formalizing their friend and family loans. You want to make sure that Thanksgiving uh, is not awkward and that your friends stay your friends. There's several tools in the book that um, help formalize friend and family loans. Um, and then there's community supported models, and in, particularly in food systems, we've seen a real proliferation of these. I think most people are probably familiar with the subscription box uh, method of financing where people pay in advance, whether it's a, a, a month or a whole quarter or an entire season in advance for produce, uh, fruits and vegetables that they'll receive later, but we're also seeing more and more um, examples of this happening in other parts of the food system. Um, off the hook is a community supported fishery and then um, this picture is Avalon Bakery in Detroit where um, years ago they, they pre-sold gift certificates uh, to their future customers to finance the opening of this new retail store in what was then a downtrodden part of Detroit that has since very much picked up. Um, and here's where I want to get on a bit of a soapbox about crowdfunding because this, these pre-sales is one form of crowdfunding, but there are three different types and it's really important that as, when you're talking to either your clients or your borrowers or if you're a fundraising entrepreneur that you understand there's three different types of crowdfunding and there's different laws that apply in each of these cases. So. In the first case, you're using an online fundraising platform to raise gifts from people and in exchange for their financial gift, you might give them a token reward like a t-shirt with your logo on it or a sticker or a shout out on Facebook, that sort of thing. And the second type of crowdfunding is um, like what I described in the previous slide, the different ways of pre-selling products that you will deliver later. So this is, is technically um, a form of investment. Your, your customers will pre-purchase product that you deliver later, but they are expecting return in the form of a product. And then there's the third type of crowdfunding, which involves selling a security to a large number of investors who expect a financial return. So um, the legal defini definition of a security I won't get into, but the thing to keep in mind here is that any time an entrepreneur is offering an investment opportunity to someone who expects a financial return, there's a whole body of law, securities law, that kicks into play, and you really need to be careful um, and the, the most important thing to know here is that as soon as you're offering an investment with a financial return, you can't advertise this publicly without having gone through some pretty serious filing requirements. So again, I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but you need to know which of the three types of crowdfunding you're talking about. Um, so uh, I mentioned before these online fundraising platforms. Kickstarter and Indiegogo are two of the most popular. As an entrepreneur raising capital, you post a description of your project and a video a blurb about what you're doing, and you encourage um, everyone you know to them <laughs> and people you don't know to support your project online. I mention Credibles here because that is a way of doing the pre-sales type of crowdfunding. Um, Kickstarter and Indiegogo people use either for the gift raising form of crowdfunding or t for pre-sales, but Credibles is only for food companies um, and it's a, an exciting new program that's just been up and running in the last few months. And then Circle Up, I don't technically consider it crowdfunding because it's not looking at raising money from non-wealthy individuals. This is still only accessible to wealthy individuals, but it is an online platform that's been getting some attention, something you might want to be looking at for your clients or for yourself. And um, then micro lenders and CDFIs. So here's a, a Axion is an example of a micro lender opportunity fund. And, and these are often the same financial institutions that are offering the individual development accounts. It's not always the case, but um, and much like the organizations that offer individual development accounts, micro lending and microfinance often comes with a whole range of financial literacy training that can be very, very helpful for starting entrepreneurs and um, helping them build a, a business plan that is sound that might make them more eligible for different types of capital further on down the road. And often uh, micro lenders and community development financial institutions are both working and have a mandate to work in communities that have not traditionally had access to financing. So these could be very helpful sources of financing. And peer-to-peer um, -peer lending is something that isn't often talked about when we're looking at different uh, capital tools, but if this is a great alternative to credit cards, particularly if people have good credit records. They can often find loans of up to $50,000 for much uh, lower interest rates than that they would be able to access through um, a normal bank credit card or other credit card company. Um, and when I mentioned before, uh, sometimes people are introverted and they want money fast with a few clicks. This is, I think, probably the easiest and fastest way to get money if you are, in fact, eligible. And again, it's mostly about 
your credit score. Um, and the, the misnomer of peer-to-peer -peer lending is sort of an odd name because it implies you're borrowing money from people you know. In fact, you're not. Both Prosper and Lending Club are online platforms that connect would-be borrowers with people and increasingly institutions that want to lend them money, and often these are total strangers. Um, these aren't necessarily happening in that many places, but because they are happening at all, I wanted to mention them. Um, Whole Foods Market has a local producer loan program, so that might be a good fit if you or the clients that you're working with are looking to sell into the Whole Foods markets or are already working with Whole Foods. And then um, La Montanita Co-op in New Mexico is partnering with a local credit union to offer loans to some of their uh, vendors. So that's, this is an exciting trend that I hope picks up. And then there are federal grant and loan programs. I, I think, again, the important thing to remember here is that it's very, very challenging for people that have never had any experience with the USDA to navigate the programs. I think uh, the Compass is a, a new program or a new website portal that is hoping to change that and make it easier for people to navigate the programs. But as technical assistance providers or community leaders working with food entrepreneurs, one of the most helpful things can be to um, help folks sort through the, the very confusing map and understand which of these programs they might actually be eligible for, which of them are they stand a chance at qualifying for. Some of them are very competitive, but it's, it's really hard to sort through this, um, the USDA programs. And again, sometimes the reporting requirements are so onerous that people that qualify for loans don't end up taking them because they feel like they have to hire a full-time staff person just to, to do the reporting. Um, banks, credit unions, and other lenders, I, I, important thing here, I think, is that credit unions often offer this similar types of business lending programs as banks at much uh, better rates for folks, so it's something to keep in mind. And then there's uh, at least a couple banks around the country now that are focusing specifically on what, uh, socially responsible food businesses in some way or another. New Resource Bank is one of them. And then RSF Social Finance is not a bank per se, it's a nonprofit lender, but they are um, also focusing on food and ag businesses. Um, but again, th this comes farther along in the slide presentation because for the most part, these types of lenders are fairly conservative. They want to see that a business is either already profitable or on their way to getting there. And they'll pay a lot more attention to things like um, whether or not the prospective borrower has significant collateral to put up against the loan. So um, other federal and regional partnerships of particular interest to uh, food businesses, Farm Credit is a federally backed um, farmer-owned credit union, and so it's a cooperative, and they are doing, uh, in terms of volume, far more lending in the food space than USDA is, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be as well known, so this, this is a good place to go. They also have a beginning and disadvantaged farmer program. And, and then the reinvestment fund in Philadelphia has been doing some really interesting lending in, in terms of food access and healthy food retail, and it spawned a national program, the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, that has resulted in other public-private partnership funds around the country, including um, California Freshworks. So if one of these exists in your area, um, some of your clients might be interested, or you might be interested if this is the type of business that you are running. And then there's a, a growing number of agricultural financing funds and programs around the country including the Carrot Project. We'll hear a little bit more about that during Gray's part of the presentation, California Farm Link here. Is, uh, both those two are doing microloan programs um, for farms and food-based businesses. And then um, PV Grows is in the Pioneer Valley in Western Massachusetts, and they're doing a variety of different types of financing, um, both debt and equity, for food infrastructure projects. So. Um, again, this is a, a great area to support, I think, to start increasing the, the infrastructure and number of options for food entrepreneurs. And then there's some really interesting alternatives to the traditional models that we're seeing. Um, High Mowing Seeds is a 100% organic seed company based in Vermont, and they did a convertible debt model, which you know starts out as a loan, but they have the opportunity at the end of the loan term to choose whether or not they would like to either pay the to pay back their lenders or convert those loans to equity. So it just it gives the entrepreneur a better range of choices. Organic Valley is a, a great example of a, a farmer-owned cooperative that operates at the national scale. And um, earlier I mentioned the value of ownership. If you are a farmer-owned business, you don't necessarily want to sell equity 
to other shareholders that might not share your values, um, but they found a way, Organic Valley found a way to offer non-voting preferred stock with a fixed dividend. So this basically means that they were able to sell stock and raise raise equity financing for the business without giving up any ownership control and without giving up any of the upside as the company would grow. And then Equal Exchange, another uh, co-op, this time a worker-owned cooperative, they had a very unique partnership, still have a very unique partnership with Wainwright Bank. It's since been purchased by Eastern Bank. But they, um, the bank wouldn't give them a loan outright, but they came up with a very innovative program whereby the bank has an Equal Exchange branded CD. So as a, a general bank customer, you can invest in a CD like you would at any other bank, but it's an equal exchange branded CD and, an ex, uh, and this helps collateralize the loan that the bank then makes to equal exchange. So here's, those are some interesting innovations that are occurring. And then um, earlier I mentioned that securities law prevents people from publicly announcing that they're raising money. Um, direct public offerings is a really great way to get around some of the most onerous paperwork to be able to publicly announce that you're seeking investors. And so People's Community Market in West Oakland did this, and so non-wealthy people like me can invest in People's Community Market for as little as $1,000. So a direct public offering doesn't refer to the type of security you're offering. You can still offer um, a loan. You can still offer equity. You can do even revenue sharing models. You choose the terms, but um, if you file direct public offering paperwork, this just means that you can offer it to the public, which makes it appealing. And then there's angel investors. Uh, this is usually more appropriate for, um, or traditional angel investors are usually more appropriate for businesses that are expecting to grow very large very quickly. You know, an average angel investor wants to see a huge return um, in as soon as five to seven years. Um, an investor circle is a, a good network of angel investors to know. It's the longest running national network of angel investors looking for businesses that are solving social and environmental problems. Uh, problems and uh, Golden Seeds is uh, an angel network that's looking at women-owned businesses. Um, and I put some money on this slide, but I'm realizing it's not necessarily that appropriate. But that's a network that started as a project of Investor Circle, and so most of the people that were really interested in socially responsible food businesses and local food businesses realized that the traditional angel investing model was not appropriate for the majority of those businesses, and so they split off now into a new national organization that is. Um, gathering folks that want to figure out what's the best way of getting money into these types of smaller scale businesses that might be looking at lower returns over a longer period of time, or not necessarily, but at least they're having that conversation. That's a great organization to be aware of. And then um, if you're working with a business that is hoping to be the next organic this or that in, in the big box stores, then private equity and venture capital firms come into play. Um, these are three that are currently working in, um, usually they consider this the, the green consumer products space. Um, and then the last category of investors is foundations. Um, increasing number of them are at least interested in exploring the possibility of doing program or mission related investing from their program funds or from their endowments. Um, there's a lot more talk about this than action. I don't usually recommend that people pursue this route as a source of financing for their food business unless it's very, very clear that they're doing something that is 100% charitable in nature. And if, um, again, if you already have a, a very strong existing relationship with a the funder, then um, that might make sense. But otherwise, it's, um, it's going to be a really difficult row to hoe. Um, sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders and Mission Investors Exchange are both uh, networks of foundations that are exploring this space. Um, so again, we get back to this very complicated puzzle. You know, what is the role that you are playing and how can you best help complete that puzzle? Um, I think over and over we've, we're realizing that technical assistance is the, the missing link often. And so technical assistance is, it can take many forms. It can look like business planning. It can look like um, financial literacy. It can look like elevator pitch training. It can look like, again, um, mapping out the space and who are the different financial players that, that exist in your area. Um, who might, who's providing this technical assistance? It could be nonprofits, it could be small business development center mentors, extension agents, the lenders themselves are often providing this technical assistance. And um, again, the, the professional service providers, whether it's attorneys, accountants, investment bankers, or consultants, um, my, my general feeling is that the a really important leverage point, again, with all of these is to help everyone understand the full gamut of financing tools that are available in an area so that we can then start to identify what 
uh, what might be the best choices for the individual entrepreneurs that we're advising, but then also to help identify where some of the gaps are, like perhaps some of these pieces aren't being covered. So um, with that, I'm going to end, and I'm really excited to be sharing this uh, platform today and this webinar with, with Gray at CEI, because I think it's one thing to talk about these issues from a very theoretical um, research type perspective, but it's another to actually be doing this on the ground and helping entrepreneurs not only with the technical assistance, but also helping package together some of the different players. So with that, I will pass it on to Gray. Thank you. Yeah, let me let me let me read your introduction, Grace, so people people know where uh, where you're coming sure. from. Um, and Elizabeth wasn't kidding when she was saying that she was going to pack in a lot of information. Huh? <laughs> Gray Harris is the director of sustainable agriculture at CEI, a community development financial institution in rural Maine. She coordinates business technical assistance and aligns financing with local food system businesses from farmers to retailers in Maine and the Northeast. She participates in numerous action-oriented agriculture initiatives statewide, is on the steering committee of Slow Money Maine, and pretty much loves anything to do with food. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here with you and Elizabeth. As Jeff said, my name is Gray Harris, and I run the Sustainable Agriculture Program at CEI. And to give you a little bit of framing, um, CEI is a Community Development Financial Institution, or a CDFI, that Elizabeth mentioned um, in her previous slide deck. And it essentially means we are a private sector financial intermediary that serves low income, low wealth, and underserved communities. We combine public and private uh, resources, in including philanthropy. And we have experience working as a social enterprise and serve clients who run social enterprises and provide finance that delivers both financial returns and, and real change and solutions for our clients. We're focused on the triple bottom line, investing in rural sectors of farms, fisheries, and forests. So the Sustainable Ag and Food System Program at CEI is busy creating opportunity along the entire value chain from farms to retailers. And our mission is to rebuild a food system that supports local farm production, uh, local value chains, and makes local healthy food accessible and affordable to all people. And that's a really important point. We're working from both the client side, um, the operator side, as well as the consumer side, um, both underserved operators of food system businesses and creating access for underserved con consumers on the other. And that is a really tough nut to crack. And we, we can't hit it with every deal every time, but that's the standard and that's the goal. Um, we do our work in three uh, predominant ways. Um, the first is we offer business technical assistance. Our program offers direct TA uh, to our clients, but we also coordinate a lot of TA um, in a team-based business planning effort. Um, and we also connect folks to industry resources and networks. And I love the TEA, there are so many TA providers on the line today, and that we are all talking about it because it is at the heart of the matter. You know, to assist in developing these investment quality business plans. Um, you know, financing is not necessarily the goal of, uh, the, the, the only goal of what we do. Um, and rather, it's really increasing business viability, vigor, and sustainability over time and increasing the operator capacity to manage and grow the businesses um, successfully. We also offer, though, financing from debt to equity as little as a $10,000 microloan to more than a $500,000 loan or equity investment. And we also offer the really um, key role of coordinating multiple sources of capital uh, for our clients in any particular deal, trying to understand which is the most appropriate form at that business's stage of growth and making the right match between investor or financial institution and the client um, to create the capital stack that gets the client what he or she needs. And finally, we're engaged in project-based and industry initiatives and networks in Maine, um, and regionally and nationally. So in terms of financing, most of the work we do most of the the time is lending, and it's pretty straightforward. And that's to say the product is pretty straightforward, the loans, but the process is still pretty hard. I mean, traditionally, businesses in this sector, especially the farms, have real challenges accessing capital from conventional sources like the banks, which is why uh, the agriculture program at CEI is here. Um, you know, making loans to farmers and value chain businesses in this emerging sector requires a level of industry understanding and risk tolerance. And a 
pretty deep due diligence to understand the business model and all the risks and how those risks are being managed. Um, but we're motivated to get to yes, and we want our clients to grow and achieve their goals to create the food system we all want to be a part of. So uh, two really great examples of typical farm clients in the CEI ag portfolio um, show the range of this lending. Uh, we have Village Farm in Freedom, Maine, which is a wonderful small organic family farm where we made a $15,000 microloan for a greenhouse and irrigation equipment. Uh, we manage the Carrot Project um, Fund uh, here in Maine for Dorothy Sopitz Carrot Project out of Massachusetts, and that was a wonderful use of those funds into that project. On the other side of the spectrum, we have Misty Brook Farm, where we did a $500,000 mortgage finance, um, and we partnered with the Farm Service Agency of the USDA to do that, and it was a really good experience, and we created a, a lasting relationship, not only with the farmer um, client, but also with the Farm Service Agency. Uh, we did a bridge loan for them as they were short of funds. They had approved this loan, but they were short of funds. And so we bridged um, their portion of this until such time as they receive more allocation of funding. So these are two fairly straightforward deals, as straightforward as any of these in this ag sector can be. Um, however, many of our food system deals are, most of our food system deals are not this straightforward, both in terms of you know, the product or the process. Um, and frankly, this is where the work that Elizabeth has been doing and where practitioners like CEI um, are innovating are so important. So before I get into some of those actual deals, I want to set the stage and spend a little time on CEI's experience. And this really is CEI's experience um, on where we are in terms of financing uh, food system businesses. I'm going to walk you through this slide a little bit um, because I know there's a lot of information here. So where we are is that purple circle in the middle. And this is a wonderful, wild, and undefined place somewhere between the worlds of grants and finance, uh, where there are many food system businesses moving towards stronger revenue-based models who need financing and have been or want to or are working that grants spectrum pretty hard and, and should. There's lots of good opportunity there to get that seed capital to lay the foundation for their businesses. Um, but they are moving towards the financing spectrum and trying to figure out what kinds of financing are going to be the right fit for their business. And knowing that they, in order to grow and really take flight, that's where they need to move towards. And this where we are section is, not, is also where CEI finds itself often. Um, we're here, these businesses are here, and many financial intermediaries and investors are also here and entering every day. There seems to be um, a new group or a new institution interested in food system finance every day and trying to determine their role and their expectations for return and how to work with each other. So what we decided is that we recognize that many of these food system businesses need financing other than what's available on the market currently, even from a non-traditional lender like a CDFI, like CEI. Uh, they need tailor that's, that's tailored to their cash flow needs and sensitive to thin margins. And that capital may not look like market rate capital or anything that's standard out there. So we realized we needed a new kind of capital to help these businesses grow, some kind of transition capital, which is why CEI created a small, discrete pool of funds called the Catalyst Fund to address this gap. And the parts of this fund that are really important is this, um, what we're calling advisory capital. It's financing um, capital with the deep value add of TA, both in the pre-financing stage and then continuing over the term of the financing. We walk alongside these businesses um, to get them to the point of financing and then after the financing to make sure that they can manage and navigate bumps in the road. We also are offering in this products, and a uh, typical product um, that we've uh, dubbed debt with training wheels um, is a really great example of, of uh, the kind of fit that we are attempting um, between capital needs and uh, client needs. And I'll explain in the next slide an example of that. Equally important 
is, uh, you'll see on the left this collaboration um, bar, is collaboration and communication between and among the financial entities to determine what the roles are and who brings which piece of financing to the capital stack. Um, there is so many uh, synergies that are possible, but there's also so many ways we can be duplicative um, or trip over each other. And it's really important to coordinate um, efforts as much as possible uh, to get these clients um, what they need. And that is the goal that we all want. So we should be able to come together and we should be able to coordinate and collaborate in this way. So what does this look like in practice? Uh, I want to talk to us a few minutes about Farm Fresh Rhode Island and Pawtucket Rhode Island. This is an incredible business. Um, it's a food hub committed to growing a local food system and create affordable access to local fresh and healthy foods for all people. It sources from more than 60 regional farms and through its market mobile and veggie box programs, among others, connects consumers, uh, with in consumers and institutions with local and healthy food. It's created at least 50 local food jobs and has done incredible programs in the juvenile justice system and um, continues to innovate and create every step of the way. We have been helping them um, as they transition from that subsidy-based nonprofit model to a revenue-based self-sustaining one. Um, as a nonprofit with no experience with business finance, um, it's really no surprise that Farm Fresh Rhode Island was a little wary of incurring debt and taking it on um, and understanding what that meant. They also knew they needed to, to try it out because they need to grow and thrive and they want to get there. Um, that TA, to grow and thrive, so what I want to say before they even got to that point is that the TA was a critical component of this deal and really shows the, the power of um, partnerships. Uh, CEI contracted with Wholesome Wave in Bridgeport, Connecticut to deliver in-depth TA and they worked with Farm Fresh Rhode Island over a period of 12 months to help the business and the operator strengthen the business model and develop a plan for growth. Um, and it was really this critical work that has enabled us, CEI, to actually finance them. And the result is this debt with training wheels type of financing. Um, a $100,000 term loan at below market rate and at extended terms, recognizing that that was what Farm Fresh needed to grow. And we developed that with them, uh, really trying to understand what their capital needs were and what they had a tolerance for. Also recognizing that you know, we had a certain tolerance too and we had to be really careful about satisfying our own criteria. Um, and compliance, frankly, on our side. So the point of this debt with training wheels piece, and it's really important to mention this, is that um, even though there's an assumption there, and I think you all can figure it out, is that um, the assumption is that below market rate, uh, non-standard capital, is not really a long-term strategic solution uh, or strategy for business finance. So we really want to work with folks who are committed to moving increasingly towards that revenue-based model and can function in conventional markets and tap into conventional financing at some point. Because we believe that is the capital that's here, at least right now, for the long term. And so building that vigor and that viability is really moving towards being able to work with some of the conventional financing. Because some of the subsidized financing, some of these debt with training wheel products, um, really are just a stepping stone along the way. And I'll say CEI, um, like many other CDFIs um, in the country, has been very lucky to receive Healthy Food Finance Initiative funds from the Department of Treasury, and that really enabled us to do this kind of work with this project. Our other example that um, I'm really excited about and want to share with you is with Northern Girl in Caribou, Maine. Um, if you've ever been to Maine, Caribou, as you know, is one of the mo northernmost um, towns. You can hit the Maine border and drive for six, seven hours and still not quite be there. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a great little company. It's a value-added uh, processor of locally grown veggies in Maine's northernmost county, Aroostook. It supports local farm production and supplies institutional and retail markets, and was founded really to address the clear need for small-scale processing of vegetables 
for the local, the smaller scale local family farms uh, in the county who are not producing for the commodities market. So we made a $25,000 mission-driven patient equity investment with deeply discounted a dividend rate that accrues yearly and a put option at year five um, where we sell the stock back at the company at which time the equity converts to debt, a note payable to CEI with a term of five years. And that was really where we needed to get with them. They needed to get with us to be able to do it. Um, and it was critical for them to receive this financing to support their operations in a window of time where there was no other funding coming in. Um, and again, in terms of TA, we bring a very deep bench of equity expertise uh, to Northern Girl as an investor, and we'll be working with them closely over the next years. Uh, you'll note in both of these examples, I haven't said what the actual rate and terms are, and that's very intentional. Um, we find that people get hung up on rates and terms when they hear them, and they latch onto it as if, ah, that's the magic product, that's, you know, that's the financing product when really the financing for each of these was so individually tailored to the needs of the business that um, every single one of them is going to be different and you're going to arrive at a place of understanding and agreement um, in a different place every single time. Um, and what works for one isn't going to work for another. So really the key is you've got to get to know the businesses. You need to establish relationships, um, deep relationships with these folks that are going to last over a long amount of time. Um, so that you can work these things out. And finally, I just want to end again on this uh, working this groove of business technical, technical assistance is critical to success. We can't overstate the importance of TA. TA has been critical in every single food system deal we've done. You know, TA manages uh, the risk and allows for the innovation in financing. Um, it enables us to increase our risk tolerance and to take the leap um, to support these businesses. Um, and that TA is the business planning, it's the whole network of folks in the industry, so you understand, you know, not only the network and the landscape, understand where the business is in the industry, but who they're talking with, who they're working with, and making sure they have a team of essentially advisors that can surround them as they move forward. And that's part of the work we can coordinate, but it's certainly part of the, the work that we do directly as well. Um, you know, as a CDFI, we add value by offering advisory capital, and we measure our impact and success on things other than um, the number and amount of loans. You know, we look at the overall strength and viability of businesses to function and um, also achieve that mutual uh, mission goal of supporting a sustainable local food value chain and food system um, that creates affordable access to consumers. And we bring the systems frame to every deal to understand how our client's food system business affects all the other businesses up and down the chain. And we think about how do we strengthen those pieces in the chain because we know one weak link threatens the chain as a whole. And so, again, that's where industry and project initiatives and networks are really important and relationships um, and a deep understanding of the industry. And by being engaged in those, we can understand that broad landscape and connect the dots and give lift to the sector as a whole. Thank you, Gray. All right, so now we, uh, we enter our questions and answers uh, section. And there have been a lot of wonderful questions submitted already. Please keep them coming. Um, uh, let me start out, uh, Elizabeth, with you on a, a technical point. Um, Carol mentions that IDAs have small caps for funds. I, is there a way for people to pool them? That is a great question. I don't actually know, and that's true, and that's why I put IDAs sort of very early on in the life cycle of a business. It's probably more appropriate for entrepreneurs before they even start their businesses to help get their own personal finances in order. Um, in terms of pooling them, um, I was speaking to one of the principals at eMoney Pools, one of the uh, lending circle platforms that's uh, formalizing the, the project of, of money pools and helping report successful payments to credit bureaus. And he was saying that they're looking at a way of combining um, lending circles and IDAs so that that helps people kind of increase the amount that they're looking at. But in terms of, of combining them in other ways, I'm not familiar. Okay. Um, 
Great. This is this is a, a really great question. I'm, I'm glad someone asked this. Um, Robert says, since sustainable farms are often diversified and complex, it's challenging to establish financial benchmarks. For example, a model P&L, uh, which is a profit and loss statement for a CSA farm. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, I will mention in the case of a CSA farm, Farm Credit has done uh, a benchmarking study uh, on CSA farms in the Northeast, um, which is a, a possible reference. Um, but what, what does CEI use for, uh, for benchmarking? That is a great question, and you bet it's really tough. Um, we've been working closely uh, with the CARAT project and some of our uh, regional um, network folks, like Mark Canella out of the University of Vermont Cooperative Extension, to try to get at some of those ratios and benchmarks. And we really don't have them. Um, so what we look at is, uh, honestly, we look at cash flow, and we look at the market, and we look at the strength of the operator when we are doing our due diligence on any of these loans. Um, you know, the five C's of credit, seven C's of credit, that, that might be a term you've heard floating around. Uh, we know that it, sometimes, yes, there is collateral, and we are collateral-based lenders, um, but collateral does not pay back loans. Cash flow pays back loans. So we want to understand, one, just how does the cash flow pay back the debt? And we need to see month-to-month, 12-month -month cash flow. And knowing that there are going to be some months, let's say in Maine, certainly mm, January, February, March, that are really lean. And what we might do is match repayment terms uh, to that cash flow so that you would be, let's say, interest only, or maybe even do a payment abatement for a month or two until your cash flow picks back up again. Um, so I hope that answers your question. We, we do not have distinct benchmarks, but we do look for debt service coverage, um, and we do look for the cash flow to be able to pay back your loan because we do not want to finance anybody into trouble and back them into a corner and give them a loan they can't afford. So we really we do a deep dive into that cash flow. It's a, it's a lot of homework. It's, it's good. Um, mm -hmm. So sticking with you, Gray, um, Deb asks, well, who pays for the technical assistance that you provide alongside these loans? Um, so, for instance, your work with Wholesome Wave, but in general. In general. Yeah, another great question because as TA really um, is given some lift, we are looking at all sorts of creative ways to raise funds for TA. Um, we're a nonprofit, so I'm continually raising funds to support our operations. Um, not only my program staff of, of two and now three, but also the uh, business counselors that we have on deck here. Uh, we have a battery of small business development center counselors that we host. Um, those are free TA services once there's money raised to support their work. Those are free TA services. And the first thing I do is always coordinate the free TA services um, that are offered through public agencies and through um, federally supported um, agencies and or some other initiatives, which I'll mention in a second. Um, and then the trick is that, or actually I won't mention it, I'll mention it now. The trick is at some point some of those TA services that are critically needed, let's say legal, let's say accounting, marketing, um, generally there aren't TA providers that will do that work pro bono, uh, at least not for the long term. So folks like the Fair Food Fund are busy raising um, a TA fund that would go for paying consultants to work with certain farms, and there's an application process for that. Um, we managed a fund like that here at CEI and consider raising funds again for that work. Um, but as a nonprofit, we certainly raise money to support the TA efforts that we do, and I think that is mostly how this work is happening. Now, again, we also um, at times request a cost share because what we've seen is that when folks have a bit of um, skin in the game, as they say, and pay for something, they're more likely to do their homework and they're more likely to show up for uh, appointments. That's just human nature. Um, so maybe an 80-20 cost share. Um, just something to, to meet us all halfway. Everyone meets halfway. Skin in the game, very, very important. Um, Elizabeth, a uh, question. Um, could you address the need for FINRA certification of people engaged to help raise funds from people with wealth? And let us know what FINRA is as well. <laughs> 
Um, great. Uh, well, honestly, I can't tell you exactly what FINRA stands for, but I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that if you are ever paying someone to help you raise financing, um, there is a body of law that covers that, and they need to have certification <laughs> to be able to do that work. So, I mean, particularly if you're looking at someone who is hoping to get a, a cut of the funds that they raise, or if they're uh, making introductions to wealthy people on your behalf, this, this is a, a piece of work that um, is governed by certain laws, and you want to make sure that they do have the appropriate certification. And again, um, as I want to talk a little bit about the, the difference between raising money from accredited versus non-accredited investors. Which, uh, an accredited investor is defined as somebody that has, I think it's $200,000 verifiable income every year, or uh, a million dollars in assets not including their home, and that the, those numbers change for couples. But um, what you are legally allowed to offer in terms of investment opportunities to accredited investors is, is different than what you're legally allowed to offer to those of us who are not accredited investors. And this is something that uh, came about to prevent investment fraud, which was happening quite a lot um, during the Great Depression. And so um, again, I just I want to flag for people that there's, there's quite a bit of securities law and other types of laws that affect your ability to fundraise. And I cover those in the book. Um, and these laws are changing a little bit, but do be careful if you start using uh, or paying professionals to help you um, get introduced to accredited investors. Caution is, is a wise course. Um, a, a technical question about um, kick, Kickstarter type fundraising. Um, Jesse asked, um, mentioned that gifts are not taxable, um, but are the funds raised through Kickstarter taxable? Uh, or generally, um, what are the tax implications? Sure. Well, there are there actually is a law that applies to gifts as well. Um, these apply actually to the people making the gifts. So I think I can't remember the exact number. It's something like thirteen thousand may have gone up to fourteen thousand a year that any one individual is allowed to give to another. Um, so as a as a business, you're right that that things are not taxable, but it really depends on how you're using Kickstarter, and this goes back to the question of which type of crowdfunding are you doing. Um, if you're using it as a gift campaign and you're offering people little tchotchkes as, as token rewards for the money that they are giving you, that's one thing. If you are using Kickstarter as a pre-selling platform, so you're, you're offering people, I don't know, one of my favorite examples is uh, a, a business that's a falafel food truck. And so if you're offering people falafel, they, they pay you now, they'll deliver it later. You could you know, buy eight for the price of five now. Um, that's taxable in terms of income tax. So you, you definitely want to check with your accountant about the, the type of crowdfunding campaign that you're offering before you decide what your reward structure is going to be because you will be um, looking at paying income tax on a pre-sales campaign. So the answer is, it depends. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so Brian is, at, let me um, paraphrase this question. Brian is asking, um, when you take um, a business plan to an investor, how, how deep should each facet of uh, a complex operation, such as, say, a food hub, be? Um, you know, do, you, do you give the 100-page business plan, or do you give a five-page summary business plan? Who are you asking? Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, we both I, I have think opinions. You, yeah, so, yeah. So, so I think you should both play. Bray, why don't you go first, and then uh, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, it depends. Um, it depends on the amount you're being, uh, you are asking for. If you're looking for $20,000, $15,000, that's a lot different than $200,000 or $800,000. Um, we, honestly, more is better in our minds. Um, we want to know that folks have done um, the deep dive into their business and understand every nook and cranny and where every single cent's coming in and every single cent's going out. You know, that said, you don't need a 100-page business plan for a $15,000 loan, typically. Um, now, again, we're not an investor in that sense. So a different investor who has a CDFI, we're going to want something different than um, an, a single investor that you'll 
approach. So really just speaking from our perspective. Um, and you know, honestly, I would not be afraid to just um, first just start a conversation and like an informational interview and see what they need and see what the individual investor or the institution needs from you um, before you go through a whole lot of work and effort uh, to do something that might not um, be the right fit. Yep, and that, that's exactly what I would have said too um, with a bit of a twist. Um, the answer is of course it depends um, and not only on how much you're asking for but who you're asking and when in the conversation you're actually presenting this business plan. So if you're presenting a business plan as a conversation starter, if you're trying to hook their interest, then you want something that is much shorter that really just uh, covers the, the highlights and um, the exciting bits and pieces to hook their attention so that you can get a meeting later on. If the business plan is for your own purposes, you want the 100 page version. Um, but you know, if it's meeting three and they're asking for a more formal business plan, you know, maybe it's the, the 10 page version, but be prepared, you know, have your 100 page version on your person so that you can answer any questions that might come up. So, but it also really depends on what type of of investor you're talking about. If you're going to a bank or a commercial lender that wants to know things like cash flow, that's completely different than if you're talking to an equity investor, an angel investor, a professional individual investor that might want to know a lot more about, say, the impact areas that you're addressing or some of the other aspects of the business that they might be quite familiar with. So it, it really depends on the context. Okay. Um, excellent advice. Um, do either of you have any experience or knowledge of uh, these uh, so-called halal mortgages? Um, these are, uh, I believe, the mortgages that are acceptable um, under Islamic law. Do, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the way they work is uh, an asset is wholly owned by a partnership, for instance, a bank and a farmer, and the junior partner, for instance, the farmer in this case, buys an increasing ownership over time Great. It sounds like you have some experience. Do you want to talk to it? Well, we the Sharia lending um, platform is something that we do do here at CEI, mostly through our immigrant, immigrant and refugee program at um, Start Smart. Um, and so I don't actually have that experience with um, halal producers, but just to say that it is workable and um, pretty straightforward in terms of the lending that we've seen um, where uh, interest rates are actually replaced by um, a fee structure. Um, and that's really all I can speak to it, to, but to say that it, there are solutions and there are ways to work it through. Yeah, I think that this, this is an example that really highlights the importance, again, of, of really taking the time to work with an entrepreneur to understand what their particular values and priorities are and then making sure to find a financing solution that fits because one size does not fit all and um, there are more and more innovative structures like this that are becoming more popular but you might have to do a little bit of homework to find out who the, the different lenders are or mm -hmm. financing providers are that can, can work with these types of parameters. Mm -hmm. Patrick asks, is there a point when a community food business or food hub gets too large? And there are restrictions on exporting outside of the local community in order to avoid becoming a non-local community food business. Do you mean criteria in terms of the financing, covenants on the financing that would not allow for that? Well, I, I can only ask Patrick. <laughs> so Patrick, if, if you want to uh, write that in. I mean, I, I, I might not have heard the question right. Um, I, I think the answer is n no. Um, I think we would, because we'd like to look out a few, you know, two, three years for the growth plan of any um, business we work with, um, that sounds like a, a, a rather um, large expansion strategy that would be mentioned in any two, three year plan. Um, but no, I mean, we would be, we would be open to that. I, mean, it, I guess we would just want to know how the local community um, is still being served and the mission that the original intent and mission of the business that was supported. Um, there would just be a big conversation around that. And you know, th unanticipated things happen. And when you have a term on a loan that let's say goes out 10 years 
you can't foresee all of the changes that business is going to go through. And you don't really want to micromanage those changes either. I mean, you, you need the operator to be nimble and entrepreneurial. So as long as the lines of communication are open, we can talk with folks every step along the way and get to a solution. And I think when it, when it comes to local or some of the other facets of what might constitute a sustainable business, I put that, that term in quotes, it really depends on the agreement that you have between the investor and the, the borrower or the investee. It's, it's not like organic where you have an agreement that you know, this is a binary, federally certified definition. You're going mm -hmm. to produce in an organic fashion or you're not. There is no generally accepted definition for local any more than there is a generally accepted um, definition for high impact. So if there's, a, if there's a, a CDFI, for instance, that's really looking at job creation, they might be really excited if the business scales beyond the local community because it's creating more jobs for local community members. So it's, um, it's an interesting question, I think, because there are people that are lending or investing within a local community that don't necessarily need to see the impact happening where they are locally. So this is, especially when we're talking about community finance, it's, it's really a matter of having that conversation and making sure that everyone's on the right page and having scenarios for what might happen if things don't go as planned. I, I keep hearing uh, it's about the relationship and yeah. it depends, um, which yeah. is great, which is great. That's exactly, you know, that's, uh, I, I think mm -hmm. that um, really uh, opens the space up for for creativity, um, which is which is wonderful. Um, all right, uh, my the final question that we have time for um, is um, a few people are asking uh, for your each of your suggested sources for uh, technical assistance uh, online. Uh, are, are there templates, business templates, or, or um, other resources that um, you all feel are uh, mm -hmm. very high value. So, Gray, you want to go first and then Elizabeth? Uh, sure. Wow. There are so many resources for technical assistance. And you can go online and Google up business plan templates, and you will get, you know, 10,000 hits. Um, you know, I would start, my own suggestion would be start in your local area and see who's out there for business counselors, maybe in the small business development counselor arena. Go to your local um, agricultural organizations, um, public, or, you know, state department of ag, um, uh, your nonprofit groups, um, and you know, see what they're using um, and see what, what they've done to tweak it for agriculture in their particular area because agriculture is so place-based and markets are so place-based when you're serving local communities that anyone who's worked in that sphere um, will really be able to pick up the nuances of what that business plan needs to address and talk about in terms of market but in terms of just supplies and costs and things like that. Um, the land-grant universities have a raft of information that you can tap into Cornell um, for one, has terrific agricultural uh, templates. Uh, it, it's places like that that um, I would tap into first. And Elizabeth, I'm sure you probably have a whole longer laundry list of other resources to go to immediately. Um, sure. Well, I think what I would mention is that so often um, the businesses that make up a sustainable food system or socially responsible food system, local, regional food system, they're, they're not actually producers and so at that point it can be very helpful to look for whether it's a green business mm -hmm. network or a locally owned business network so I want to mention the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies I think there's about 60 or 70 different um, networks of local business owners around the country so if you visit their website at bealocalist.org um, you can find a local network there and they, they often have in amongst their membership different, whether it's accountants or attorneys that are really focusing on um, either socially responsible business or community-oriented businesses that might be able to provide better assistance than some of, you know, again, I, I think in some of the small business development center offices, you'll find some really great mm -hmm. folks that might know a lot about mm -hmm. some of the non-traditional, more innovative, socially responsible business models, but often these things are very perplexing to people that have never ventured beyond the traditional business models and so it can be really great to find someone that really shares your values. Um, again, the Slow Money Network also has local networks around the country. Um, they could be a really great source of 
um, not only prospective investors, but also professionals that, that they've been working with to either help with their programs or um, helping their investors understand the landscape. So that, that could be a really great source. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that Finance for Food hasn't done yet, but will be doing soon, and I just got funding from the 11th Hour Project to do this, thank you, um, is that I'll be putting out a series of legal investment uh, agreement templates so that that will start normalizing some of the more um, values-friendly investment agreement so that, again, you can take this to your attorney or your accountant and say, well, I know that this has worked in the past. We could do something like this. So what does that sound like to you so that we're not forcing entrepreneurs around the country to start creating their own financing templates from scratch um, to, to fit in some of the more entrepreneur-friendly values? So that's, that's one resource that will be available soon, and you can sign up for my newsletter if you want to um, keep track of that project and, and be alerted when those uh, te legal templates become available. So those are a couple resources I'll mention. Those are great, Elizabeth. Fantastic. Thank you to uh, Elizabeth and Gray. I hope this serves as a good introduction on how to think creatively about finding the right capital for food businesses. If you want to dig deeper uh, in the post-webinar survey, just let us know if you're interested in getting more information about Elizabeth's new book, or if you're interested in having her come speak for a lecture or a more in-depth workshop. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website along with the 50 other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to send others who you think would have liked to heard this, have heard this presentation and uh, uh, re review uh, the, the flurry of information, get, uh, visit it again, uh, and uh, visit it or, or review some of our other uh, archives, um, ngfn.org slash webinars. This webinar should be up within a few business days, and our webinars are organized into topics. If you look in the left-hand navigation area, so you can dig into whatever it is that interests you. Our uh, NGFN webinars are the third Thursday of each month, starting at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, noon 30 Pacific. Sign-up links are always at ngfn.org slash webinars. This summer, we are digging deep into food hubs after we take a brief hiatus in July. In August, we'll present the results of the first ever Food Hub benchmarking study. A benchmarking study analyzes key financial metrics of a business sector by collecting data from a representative set of those businesses. This allows others in those business to understand the health of their own operation, can indicate areas where the business may need to focus more effort, and most appropriately for this webinar, can also be used by investors and lenders as a way to assess a request for capital. In September, we will present the results of analysis an analysis of a large food hub survey run by Michigan State University's Center for Regional Food Systems in collaboration with the Wall Center and the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration. This is a state of the food hub presentation including impacts hubs are having, the variety of models, how much local food are they actually moving, and much more. And in October we're collaborating with the National School Food Network on a National Farm to School Month, which is October, <laughs> to present how Foods are assist, uh, food hubs are assisting with moving healthy local foods into schools. There are some schools where food service can buy from directly from farms, but most require their aggregation and distribution logistics of a food hub to make a program possible. So join us in October for some of those success stories. You can let us know in the post-webinar survey if you'd like to be automatically registered for any or all of our next webinars. I do want to let you know about a couple other Wallace Center websites, foodhub.info, I mentioned at the top of the uh, discussion. It's a food hub hub of information, research, case studies, a map of many of the food hubs across the country. The NGFN Food Hub Collaboration is working closely with nine food hubs across the country to document their stories, including, by the way, Farm Fresh Rhode Island that Gray mentioned. Please uh, read about our study hubs there. There are even links to TA providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. The NGFN Food Hub Collaboration is building a community of practice of Food Hub managers and staff, and also Food Hub supporters. We have a newsletter about every other month, TA and networking opportunities, and more. In the post-webinar survey, you can also indicate to us if you'd like more information about this uh, opportunity. And foodshedguide.org is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive text and case studies and an emphasis on how to have a viable uh, food, viable business in a food value chain. Learn about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on a legal status. Foodshedguide.org for more. You can find the 
NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is also on Facebook. Search for the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Again, if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know in the post webinar survey, and we will sign you up. Please contact us at any time. The email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank again Gray and Elizabeth, and would like to thank you for your time today. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out that survey that will open in your web browser in just a moment. Thank you, and this concludes the webinar. Thank you. Thanks.